because of the way schedules came together that we were able to get this team. It's a providential one. I have had fewer greater joys in life than to work with this team here. Melissa Schubert, uh, who is another Shakespearean from Tory, is not with us this morning. She's uh, an indispensable member of our team, uh, but her father has passed away, and she's there with family. Nevertheless, we also recognize that there are, in our audience, God willing, members of all sorts of tribes and nations, different languages, different cultures, different peoples. And you're looking this morning at a bunch of white guys up here and singing songs of even older white guys who are with these and thous. And I'm asking you this morning to set that aside because of goal number two of the Irish program and this theme right here. And that is to focus our attention on the one who matters. The whole bit about Iris is that if your eyes are good, your whole body's gonna be full of light. And we wanted this opportunity, all the engagement that we had with students to direct us more clearly toward our great maker. Therefore, I'm asking this morning that even though you walked in here, well, yes, the brave, the few, the ones who really needed the shovel credits. And incidentally, because this uh, section up here has been bought it off, if I remember my uh, apocalyptic revelation imagery correctly, these would all be the sheep. Is that correct? Is that correct. Right? Mm, yeah, yeah. 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 This morning. I'm just thinking this. Good thing. <laughs> <laughs> you may have walked in here for diverse reasons, but I'm telling you that you were drawn. And the Holy Spirit has for you this morning an encounter with himself that will be life transforming. I don't know what it's going to be, but I and everyone else up here is fully confident that this morning, you are going to see him. And to that end, you later. We've got Jonathan Anderson. He's going to start us off by looking at images that help us to uh, wrestle with oh, the central image for us today, which is going to be or this, a central uh, issue, which is going to be the question of pain and our perspective on Jonathan Anderson. <laughs> Good morning, nice to be here, nice to see you all. Very briefly, I want to take you to a church in Rome, uh, and it's a church called Santa Maria del Popolo, maybe, there it is. And if you enter this church through the front, uh, and you approach uh, the front of the church, off to the left, the, the back left-hand corner, there's a chapel, and the chapel from the front looks like this. <laughs> Uh, it's a chapel devoted to Peter and Paul, St. Peter, St. Paul. Um, and on the front wall, there's a, a, a painting by a famous uh, 17th century painter named uh, Annabali Karachi, uh, fine. Um, but on the left and right, there are two paintings that really stand out. They seem disintegrated with the rest of the Baroque architecture and theme. To the left is a, a painting devoted to St. Peter. And it's not your typical depiction of St. Peter. In fact, it's a St. Peter that seems to be uh, uh, in pain. Uh, it's according to Christian tradition, uh, St. Peter is, um, uh, was uh, killed in Rome, crucified, and when he was crucified, requested he not be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. So uh, they crucified him upside down. And the painting depicts uh, an old, aged Peter uh, sort of looking off to the, the, the black, the outer sort of blackness to the left. Can we go back one image uh, real quick? Um, and if this painting were to unfold, uh, the, the cross would be uh, lifted up and set into the ground, effectively lifting him out of our vision, out of our field of vision, into the unseen, into death, into that black space. Uh, and it's an aged Peter, uh, a, uh, and then pain Peter, a, a Peter being turned upside down. Uh, opposite of that painting, if we uh, advance, is a painting devoted to St. Paul. Uh, and St. Paul is, is depicted um, uh, also being turned upside down. It's St. Paul uh, in his conversion on the road to Damascus. Um, it is it is. Saul at this point, I, I suppose. It's the, it's the space in between Saul and Paul. It's, it's Saul. I, it's, I like it, it was clever. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. The interstitial space, I don't know. Uh, it's uh, St. It's Paul lying on his back underneath the horse. Um, 
again, a, 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 an image of a saint. I mean, here we have Caravaggio doing something fairly shocking in that he's depicting the saints. Indeed, uh, two of the most uh, influential uh, saints in the formation of the early church, uh, he's depicting them uh, in moments of extreme vulnerability, uh, um, perhaps pain, uh, disorientation, a certain measure of suffering. It's not uh, a, a, uh, an image of Peter and Paul triumphant, though perhaps these happen to be some of their more triumphal moments, some of their more deeply graced moments. But uh, their experience is one of, I, I would imagine, uh, disorientation and weakness, even suffering. And it's to that uh, that we want to turn our attention uh, this morning. And I'll let uh, Dr. Thomas take us from there. If you take out your swords and open to Acts chapter 9, we're going to read that scene where Paul is not flat on his back. Keep that image in your mind. Just that important yeah. image. As Paul is sprawled backward with his arms out, uh, can you put that up there instead of the goofy guy we are looking at now? Um, me, not you guys. Right. Can you just leave that up there? That'd be great for us to just have that in our minds. You see, Paul's physical position is trying to communicate something very important here. Let's read this biblical account of Paul's conversion here. Acts 9, verse 1. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of our Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters in the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Paul, a blaspheming persecutor of the church, a murderer of Christians, isn't satisfied with the amount of Christians he can get in Jerusalem, so he's heading to Damascus to try to find some there. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? I hope it's stark to you that it's the church Paul's persecuting, but Jesus identifies with his people so much that it's no different than persecuting him. And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. So it's not just some psychological subjective experience. It's something others besides Paul know is happening, although they don't have all the details. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight, and neither, and neither ate nor drank. Oh, is this wonderful irony that as Paul is losing his physical sight, he's gaining his spiritual sight. But I want you to realize how obvious it is that Paul's a confrontation here on the road to Damascus by Jesus himself is a disequilibrating, disorienting, difficult situation. He is extremely vulnerable. He's blind. He's so uh, disoriented that he doesn't eat or drink, and he's alone in a room for three days. But watch what happens. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise, and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, no doubt. And he has seen a vision. 
A man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard about him from many about this man. How much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call your name. He's basically saying, Lord, have you seen this guy's resume? Are you sure you really want me to go to this guy? But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard these things. And then what does the Lord say? Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer. For the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, probably the first words Paul ever heard from another Christian. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has seen me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Paul's beginning of his relationship with Jesus is anything but an easy delivery. It's an extremely difficult time, and Paul is the one who teaches us about suffering as well as anyone in the Bible. I had the honor of preaching at a graveside service this afternoon. And I will look in the eyes of the wife and the children and siblings and friends of Joel Schubert, and I need to say something. What should I say? What would you say? Would you say that God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose? Now, I could feel some of you just recoiling from that very idea. Would you say, uh, perhaps, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us? Would you say, for this slight momentary affliction is preparing for in us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are unseen are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Would you be tempted to say those things? I hope you'd be more than tempted. I hope you'd be profoundly confident to say those things and not fear appearing trite and giving pat answers or simple answers because those are the answers from God himself mediated through the Apostle Paul who understood suffering and was giving anything but glib answers. And as we seek in our lives to try to frame suffering, to frame a grave sight, we must do it in light of God's perspective on everything, the grave sight in all of human history. I want you to realize that when Paul says those words that I just read, it's anything but coming easily to him. Paul gets suffering. And I don't know about you, but when I suffer, my first instinct is to feel alone in that suffering. And uh, lonely in it. And like I'm the only one who really understands this. And, and that's why maybe these things don't sound meaningful to us. But Paul understood suffering. And this suffering in his life, at the very beginning of his journey with Jesus, is filled with difficulty. And it's life-transforming difficulty. And Paul had, as the backdrop of his entire life, this kind of suffering. Paul understood suffering. Listen to how he recounts his suffering in 2 Corinthians 11. It, it involved imprisonments, countless beatings, and often near death. Five times 40 lashes less one. 40 lashes would kill you. And five times he was near the point of death with a whipping. For the first time ever, I added this up this morning, 395 scars on his back. Just from the lashes. 
Not to mention the rods, three times beaten with rods, one times stoned, three times shipwrecked, a night and a day adrift at sea. Frequent danger, toil, hardship, many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure, anxiety for all the churches. Paul gets suffering. And he realizes that suffering, as you walk with Jesus in obedience and faith, is part of of the Christian life. It's central to the Christian life and Christian growth. That's why he says to the Galatians, he was so upset by what was happening in Galatia with these Judaizers coming and adding things to faith and grace. And his authority was being challenged. You know how he ends the book of, of Galatians? He says, and no one should give me any more trouble because I bear the marks of Christ on my body. You know people would say things like, have you ever seen Paul's back? He's saying, this, this is credibility in my authority. And what's so important to realize here is the reason men like Peter and Paul were willing to suffer is because they followed the one who was the man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, who was despised and rejected, and he bore the iniquity of us all in that suffering. They knew following Christ was involving suffering, and that was part of the grief. And so as we step back now and try to frame the suffering in our lives, let's do it in light of the confident trust we have in God's perspective on our suffering and these people who got God's perspective because they got the man of sorrow. So let's reflect on this. Thanks, Eric. As we were as we were talking as faculty about all the things that suffering does in our lives, um, one thing we thought about was that suffering that all of us have an idea what God is like, and sometimes our picture of God is not healthy, it's not good, and yet God wants to have a conversation about what that picture looks like but he needs to get it out in the open. Um, one time I walked in on my middle son and he was kind of crying in, in bed. And he was, you know, classic middle child. And he was crying and, and I walked in and I said, Jason, what's wrong? He said, he said, you love Michael more than you love me, my older son. And, and I said, Jason. And I sat down and had a conversation with him and. And I said, Jason, that is just not true. And how long have you felt this way? And it kind of came out that he had felt this way for quite a while. And as a dad, I couldn't respond to that because I didn't know he felt that way. And as a human parent, I couldn't respond to something I didn't know he was thinking. And so it actually was pretty good for me to walk in and hear him articulate now that he had actually felt this way, that he kind of was second class to his older brother, and now we could finally have a really productive moment in me addressing that. Well, God's omniscient. He knows what you think about him, but he wants you to actually articulate it. And what suffering can do is actually bring you to a moment where you have these thoughts about God, right? Things don't happen the way you wanted them to happen. Prayers sometimes don't get answered. Uh, pain hits your family, and then you think, well, God, you see, you don't love me. You'll answer other people's prayers, but my prayers go unanswered. Uh, other people get awards at Biola. Guess what? I don't get awards. I get overlooked constantly at Biola, and yet I have to put on a good, cherry Biola face and compliment everybody for getting awards, but why don't I get awards? And pain often brings us to the moment where we finally articulate it and God says, great, now we can finally have this conversation. And I want to show you an A.W. Tozer quote from a book called The Knowledge of the Holy. And this is what Tozer says. He says, only after an ordeal of painful self-probing are we likely to discover what we actually believe about God. And I read that quote. I sent off two uh, academic articles and in the same week, both, both of them came back rejected. And it just happened that they came back in the same week. And I just tell you, I, it, it was, now it's not the end of the world, 
But, you know, in academics, that's kind of, you know, that's kind of where you live. And I just remember getting them both almost back to back. And I just was kind of mad at God. Because, you know, you, you, you sit with some pretty prestigious people here at Biola. And, and they get, you know, published a lot and get a lot of awards. And I got two rejection letters right away. And I kind of copped an attitude of like, see, God, you bless a lot of people and you don't bless me. And God said, you know what? I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Because I've known you felt this way. And in this painful moment, it was really good for you finally to articulate it. Now, let's have this conversation. And sometimes our pain and trials can do that. When we were talking uh, in, uh, as a group for, in our preparations for this, the story that haunted me was that of your friend uh, who was in his home. His daughter was next door babysitting. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Shouldn't have opened the door, but she did. Uh, was was raped within so many hundred feet of where the father, and what worse uh, scenario can you imagine? Except perhaps, uh, one of my classes, we're looking at accounts of the, the Holocaust, and something that members of your family experienced. Looking at, it, your, your image was, this is like, all of a sudden you realize that, okay, um, this, this Lord who loves us has allowed such things to happen to his people at worst. And all of a sudden, I think you said, your trapeze artist flying without a net. Yeah. Melissa Schubert had this quotation from John Dunn uh, that showed how he wrestled with this image uh, from, from Paul. I mean, think of it. You know, whether there are stories that you have encountered in the pages of history or the personal pain that you are even now experiencing. I know, I'm going through those situations and very quick to say, what possibly can justify that? God, what possibly could make it right? This is what John Dunn says. It is a blessed metaphor that the Holy Ghost has put into the mouth of the apostle, Hondus Gloria, weight of glory, that our afflictions are but light because there is an exceeding and an eternal weight of glory attending them. If it were not for that exceeding weight of glory, no other weight in this world could turn the scale or weigh down those infinite weights of affliction that oppress us here. What can counter it? What can justify it? Well, apparently, Jesus has seen the joys that before him. And Paul has seen this joy that he says, that weight of eternal glory so outweighs that which we experience here, however horrific, that it puts it in perspective in a way that we desperately need. And, and I'm not even convinced that at, and as we are going through things, that we exactly know how gracious God really is being. When I was, uh, this is three or four years ago, my wife had cancer. And um, as she was going through the heart of it, uh, I had two little kids uh, who were five and seven. And so I'm at home. Uh, work. I, I come home, I'm, I sort of clock out of work and clock into work at the same time. And, and I would do things like at midnight discover that no one had clean underwear um, you know, for the rest of the week. And so I'd be up doing what an academic would do, which is reading the laundry box. <laughs> okay? All right? My wife one time came down and said, what are you doing? Reading the laundry box. That's what you do before you do laundry. Um, and so um, I, I would find, and then I would I'd do the laundry, I'd get the laundry ready, I'd have to get up at 6 in the morning after finishing it around 2, and then I would take the kids to school, and then I would come here and work, and it would start all over again. And I was just trudging through these things. My wife lost all her hair, which to some of us in this row is not quite as tragic <laughs> as to others. Um, actually, even uh, Dr. Tanis shaved his hair, which was an amazing thing in honor of my wife's hair loss. He's not an attractive bald man. Um, <laughs> um, but what I discovered, and I didn't discover this until later, is that through my suffering, God was meeting me in ways I could not have imagined. People were 
holding me up literally in prayer. I, I don't know how the sleepless nights went on for over a year, and I was able to continue to do the things that I did. And it was only in reflection that I saw during my sufferings that God had mediated them and made them much less than they potentially could have been. And it's that point when I was able to also tell others, like I'm telling you, give God glory because he was there when I didn't think he was. One other thought I have on, on suffering, one of the ways we make sense of our lives is by painting pictures, and that's what John has been uh, started us out with. Another way we make sense of our lives is by telling stories. And in fact, we often paint pictures about the stories we tell, and that's what we actually had here. We do that as Christians all the time when we tell our testimony. We tell our, quote, story. I think one of the ways we do that wrongly theologically has real interesting bearing on the issue of how we process suffering. And one of the ways we tend to tell our testimonies by kind of a narrative that talks about your life, and then one day I woke up and I wrote God into my narrative. I accepted Jesus. I wrote him into the narrative of my life. And biblically, there's this interesting doctrine called the doctrine of election. And the doctrine of election says, you didn't write Jesus into your story, he wrote you into his. And the way you make sense out of a story is in the context of the whole. If the whole of your story is 70 years, or by reason of great strength, 80, then you have to make sense of everything what, that Jesus is doing within the realm of your 80 years. That's fine as long as you never accept Christ. But once you accept Christ, you realize my story has been written into his. And no longer does my story have to make sense on its own terms because the covers have been blown off the book of my life. Mm. And I have been rewritten as a chapter of a much grander story, the story of the kingdom of God. And one of our problems is that we tend to deem the book to be not good because we read a chapter or part of a chapter that we didn't like. And the goodness of the book is never dependent on any individual chapter. It's dependent on the whole. And if you think of the prophet Jeremiah, some of the greatest words we have in the scripture, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end, they're new every morning, great is thy faithfulness, all those phrases that come from Lamentations chapter 3, the promise we love to quote from Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare, not calamity, to give you future and hope, all those things, the thing you want to remember that, Jeremiah, those things didn't come true in his lifetime. I know the plans I have for you, and they'll be good 70 years from now. But for Jeremiah, he was going to die with the nation still in exile. And I think one of our problems is that, uh, let me put it this way, I'm not asking you to relinquish your hope. I'm asking you to relinquish your gavel that you drum on the table and say, God is wrong. God has failed me. And to stop and say, you know, I don't have the jurisdiction chronologically to render that judgment. He is writing a much, much bigger story. Yeah. And I, at the point that I came to Christ, chose to be written into his narrative, not to write him into mine. And the goodness or badness of my life is determined by the narrative of which I am now a part and I'm now a part of a very, very much bigger narrative. And uh, just to add to that, uh, I didn't say this part of the story I was telling, but at the beginning when we found out my wife was diagnosed, we had the elders of our church pray for her for healing. We had, um, we were spending a ton of time praying for healing and God said, no. And so we went through that. So if I would have stopped, and made a judgment at that time, it would have looked as if God had abandoned us. If I would have made a judgment somewhere in the middle of the underwear and the washing machine, I would have felt like God had abandoned us. And if I would have stopped at any of those points, the perspective that I would have had would have been woefully incomplete. This is part one of two parts. Wednesday, today has been about perspectives on pain. You are experiencing pain at the end of the semester. You are going into summers, into futures for you who are graduating. And it's exciting, but it's also daunting. There are chapters ahead that will be 
filled with trial. Today's about taking the broader picture. Wednesday is going to be answering the question, what do I do now? Where do I go from here? For those of you who will not be here with us then, I would at least urge you to hear Paul's words and his, his, his exhortation as he tells us to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, because that has weight. It is eternal. He has perspective. And he knows how to make it all meaningful and have every bit of count. This is going to be coming up. We're going to finish with this guide me home about great Jehovah, which, if anything, is a good response as we relinquish our theoretical uh, rights to know the answers and say, all right, I don't know. But God and I. She's going to come up, Dr. Corey, has a message that you have not expected you will hear today. Stay for that, and hopefully I'll see some on Wednesday. Lindsay? We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.